At Family Church, we celebrate the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus uh, all the time, but once a month, we, we celebrate using the Lord's Supper and communion, and if you're watching us regularly online, I think it'd be a great idea if you would have a cracker and juice, or if you'd have some way that you can celebrate with us, so that in the service time, when we actually have communion, you can share that with us wherever you are. I hope you can do that today. Congratulations on surviving the snowpocalypse 2019. We're going to talk about it for years, back when the 2019, when this happened. And, and you know, the cool part about what I get to hear was how many people who were followers of Jesus were out there being Jesus to their neighbors. And you know, it's one thing to put a sign in your yard and says, I believe in Jesus. It's quite another to take them groceries or to invite them up for a shower or to provide for them in some way. And there was a lot of that great stuff going on. So... Congratulations, and that's exciting, and let's keep doing that, because uh, this is not over yet. And uh, for some people, they still don't have power, but uh, if you are able, let me tell you, there's a lot of needs that people have with down trees and all that kind of stuff, and you know, a lot of guys say, well, I could never teach Sunday school class, but give me a chainsaw, I could serve God that way. So um, there's a lot of needs that people have in just cleaning up all of this, so, so don't quit be in the body of Christ. This is a great opportunity for us. In Romans chapter 12, we're talking about this process where God works in us to take us from who we were before to become more and more and more like Jesus. And that's why we call this series a becoming. It's a becoming step by step more and more like Jesus. And we're, we're working through this process of a very, very important part of this passage today which is, how does this happen? How can I get involved in making this growth process to become new? How can I make that more effective? How can I see that more in my life? How can I realize that more? And so we're going to go back to begin with and review just a little what we talked about last week in case you were not here, or even if you were and you forgot. Romans chapter 12, Pastor Craig walked us through this critically important verse. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your true and proper worship. So he he started with this idea that there's a hinge in the book of Romans. You've got all the things that happen in the first 11 chapters. And chapters 1 to 3 talk about how we are all lost. That whether you were a good Jewish observant person or whether you were a totally lost pagan worshiping idols, that we are falling short of the glory of God, that we have all sinned and that we are all dead in that sin. And then the next few chapters, he talks about who Christ is and what he's come to do and laying down his life and living a perfect life. And because he was the fully God man, when he died on the cross, he could pay for your sin and for mine. And when he raised from the dead, it shows that it was, it was accepted, that it worked. And then he, he talks about all of the ways in which God has been good to us. So then he says, therefore, in view of that, what's our response? Is to give your bodies as a living sacrifice. That offering, okay, God, here's my whole life. I give it to you. And honestly, we can't do that all at once because we're so full of ourselves. You make that first-time offer, and the Bible calls that getting saved, or the theological word is justification, where we are made right with God, not because of our goodness, but because of the gift of Jesus and because of our faith. Because the other part of Romans talks about you can't do it by works, you can't try hard enough, you can't be good enough, that it's a gift of faith that you receive. And because of that, then that defines and underlines that we live a life of worship, that now we want to give glory to God, we want to be connected to him, we want to live for him. And in fact, Craig ended with this thought, any action motivated by love for God is an expression of worship. I hope when you come on a weekend and you you sing songs to God with us and you open the scriptures together, I hope it stirs up that, that love for God and that desire to make him more famous. But I hope it doesn't quit on the weekend. I hope it goes Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, that that's our life of worship. So then the next verse that keys right off of that 
says, how does that happen? And he begins to talk about the process. So verse 2 is, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. So there's three things that we're going to draw out of this verse. First of all, he says you only got one choice. You're either conformed to the world and you become more and more like the people around you and the dysfunctional culture we're in, the dysfunctional family you're from, the dysfunctional sin nature you have, or option B is you can allow God to transform you. And then the second part is that that happens by the renewing of your mind. How do you change your mind? How does that become different? And the third part is then the result of that. As God renews your mind, as you're transformed, you get to experience this amazing thing called God's will for your life, God's destiny, God's, God's plan for you. And you get to not just know about it, you get to actually experience it. So we're going to walk through those three parts, and I hope when you get done, you'll think, okay, I know what that verse is saying. More importantly, I hope you'll say, I'm now in the process of being transformed. I'm accepting that as my life. So first part is you have to understand what is that choice? There's only two options here. He says, every day, you're either being conformed to the world or you're being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I have important news for you. The world is a messed up place. Would you agree? And it has always been a messed up place. You see, sometimes we start wringing our hands and saying, look at what's happening in America and look at how that which was used to be called good is now being called evil, and that which is, was being called evil is now being called good. And I acknowledge it's a messed up place we live in. But you know, I've been reading the Bible. <laughs> it's always been a messed up place. Clear back when the nation of Israel was started. I'm reading right now about Jacob. And Jacob, he, he marries what he think is the beautiful younger daughter, but he gets tricked into marrying the older, not as beautiful older sister. And so then he marries the younger daughter too. And then they start having baby wars. I can have more babies than you can. And the one that's infertile, she says, here's my handmaid. You sleep with her and you have more kids for me. And then the older sister says, I can do that too. And then they start naming their babies like, now my husband will love me. And now I will be justified. And now I will finally get my way. And you're thinking to yourself, this is a seriously screwed up family. If they moved in next door to you, you would think they were wacko. There's one guy and four wives and 12 kids, 13 kids. Yeah, it's like, that's messed up, isn't it? It was messed up in Jesus' day when they were worshiping idols and putting people on crosses and killing them all alongside the road. Jesus wasn't the only one crucified, you know. And I have, I have news for you also. It was messed up in the Leave it to Beaver 50s. Do I have an amen there? Somebody who lived through that? The reason for the 60s was the 50s. You see, sometimes it looks better on the outside, but sin is still sin. And messed up is what we all are without God. So here's the, here's the important point he makes. You can either be conformed the dis dysfunctional perspective, the distorted view you have of the world, the dysfunctional family you came out of, the dysfunctional culture that you live in, or you can allow God at any point in history, no matter where you're coming from, you can allow him to begin to change you into being more like Jesus. That's the only two options. Either you're squished into the mold of the world or you're becoming more like Jesus. And what this is saying is that following Jesus is always countercultural. It always has been counterculture. If you just want to be a regular person that goes with the flow, then he says you're being conformed to the world. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, then normal isn't going to be normal for you. He's going to be changing us into something that's different. So he said that's your option. And if you want to know what the world is like, Galatians chapter 5 says, let me tell you what the acts of the flesh or of the old, the old sin nature that are obviously being influenced by Satan. Here's what it's like. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, which is like 
Big parties with total excess. Never happens in America, only in other places. Idolatry, worshiping anything but God. Witchcraft, trying to use spell or omens or astrology to affect your future. Hatred, discord, fighting, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, looking out for number one. Dissensions, arguing, factions, breaking up into different teams. Envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. That's a 2,000-year-old list. It was seriously messed up. And he says, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, why there's only two choices is there's only two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of the flesh, the kingdom of doing what feels good. And then there's the kingdom of light, the kingdom of those who are God's children, the kingdom of those who are being transformed by the Spirit, the kingdom of those who are followers of Jesus. And he says, you make a choice. Every day you make a choice to be conformed to the world or to be transformed to be like Jesus. And I don't mean growing a big beard and getting a robe and sandals and going around walking in an itinerant ministry with 12 guys in Israel. I don't mean walking on water. What I mean is that you begin to love like Jesus. That we realize all that God's done to us and we reflect that love and you fall in love with God. And because of that, you begin to love the people around you. It changes how you respond. In fact, the other part of Galatians 5 where he says, here's what the fruit of the flesh is like. Then he goes on and he says, here's what the fruit of the Spirit is like. Look at this list. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance. That means putting up with people who are hard to get along with. Some of you may have had some experience during this snow snow experience. Forbearance is patience, kindness, Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. <laughs> Against such things, there's no law. That's kind of a funny added, add-on, isn't it? He says, let me tell you what letting Jesus change you will be like. It's going to be filling your life with love and joy and peace and kindness. Who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want your neighbors to have that? Who wouldn't want your spouse to have that or your kids to have that? So let me do something kind of tricky for you. I want you to read this with me again. Instead of saying the fruit of the Spirit, I want you to say, I am full of love. I am filled with joy. I am peaceful, no matter what's going on in your world. I am at peace. I have a lot of patience with people that are a pain in the neck. I am the soul of kindness. I always am concerned about other people and how they're doing. I I choose moral right decisions. I am full of loyalty and faithfulness to God and to others. I am gentle with people, never harsh, never lacking in understanding. And I am overflowing with self-control. Which one of those kind of stuck in your throat when you were kind of trying to say it? Which one did your spouse elbow you or your friends elbow you with? Yeah, like you're full of self-control. This is not what we're like on our own, is it? This is what we're like when the Spirit of God is working in us. This is what God wants to make us look like. And how do we go through that process? How do we become more of the fruit of the Spirit and less of the fruit of the flesh? Well, he says the The key in Romans 12, he says, this happens by the renewing of your mind. You have to change how you see the world. Your your brain is a powerful computer. And and the scripture in chapter 1 says, or verse 1 says, that we offer our body as a living sacrifice. And the most important part of your body is your brain. So you begin to say, God, I need to be brainwashed. I need to think differently. I need to understand differently. And you know why we need to do that? Because we start off like this. Ephesians 4 says, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Now generally Gentiles just means people who are not of a Jewish background. Here he's particularly saying the Gentiles who don't know God. Here's what people who do not know God are like. They are caught in the futility of their thinking They are darkened in their understanding. They're separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. 
That's where we start. He says we are darkened, we are ignorant, we are unaware. And those three sound like if you took a good class, you could get that fixed. But then he goes on and he says, it's due to the hardening of their hearts. And here's the problem. Most of us, who at least have been somewhat around the scriptures, we often know what the right thing to do is. You know what the problem is? We don't want to. We don't want to do it. It's a hardening of the heart problem that we are ignorant because we don't really want to be patient. We don't really want to be kind. We certainly don't want self-control. And so he says, here's where your mind starts. This is the default setting. And so we need the renewing of our mind. And what I find is this comes, and it's not in this passage right here, but I find in my own life, I find as I look at other passages of scriptures, that there are four critical steps to the renewing of your mind. And the first one is you've got to become aware. And you've got to become aware of several things. He just said in that verse we just looked at, that we're ignorant. So part of it is a learning process, that I learn who God is. I learn what it means that when I come to follow Jesus, then who am I as a follower of Christ? I begin to learn what God wants for my life, what he says about every area of my life. You know, Jesus constantly was using this formula. You've heard that it was said, but I say to you. That's what God does in our life. This is how you lived before, but let me tell you what the new plan is. Here's the new plan for marriage. Here's the new plan for parenting. Here's the new plan for how you are a neighbor. Here's the new plan for your tongue. Here's the new plan for your heart. And so part of it is we become aware of God's way. And we need to fill our minds and fill our hearts with knowing what is true and right. We also have to become aware of how sinful we are. That all those acts of the flesh that we looked at and we said, oh, that's terrible. We've got to quit saying the world's a messed up place. We've got to go, my heart's a messed up place. That I struggle with these things. I, I have those same inclinations. And given the right pressures and the right circumstances, I could do about any of those. And so we need to become aware of the, the power of sin within and, and the fact that, that when the Spirit convicts us, we need to say, God, your way is right. You know, I have people seriously say to me, well, I know this isn't what the Bible says, but we're going to move in together anyway. So are you assuming you're smarter than God? Are you assuming you're more righteous than God? Or are you just saying you don't care what God thinks? And that's often what happens, isn't it? Is that we say, well, I'm going to follow God, except where I don't want to. God's plan is not a smorgasbord where you get to pick and choose. He has a will for our life. He has a plan, and it's a wonderful. So it becomes aware of what God's wonderful plan is and how far I fall short. You know what else brings awareness to you? The people that are around you. You see, they've noticed. Because the next prior to that process is confession. When I become aware of who God is and what he's done, first of all, there's the positive confession. God, thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me whole. Thank you for your spirit living in me. You take those things that the Bible says and you say, I believe them, I accept them, I I, I will confess those. Confess just means saying the same thing God says. And then it also means that you confess sin. Have you ever noticed that we change the words for sin when it applies to me? You're arrogant, but I'm just confident. You're a liar. I just say little white lies once in a while. You're greedy. I'm just careful with my resources. And confession means that we need to call it what it is. And there's some sin words that are out of fashion because they sound awful. Because sin is awful. And so this process of confession, and you know when you confess to God, he's never surprised. I'll tell you the other part of it. When you confess to the people you live with, they are rarely surprised. Because you see, awareness means that we begin to see ourselves as we really are. How many of you don't like to see yourself on video? 
You hate it when people take pictures of you and you have to watch yourself. You know why that is? It's because the, the me in my head is a lot different than the me on the camera. I am young and strong and I have tons of hair and I am so clever. And when you watch a video, it's who is that guy? And you know what's sad? Think about this. The people that live with you, the people that live around you, the people that work with you, they have to watch that movie all the time. And sometimes God uses the other people in our life to bring awareness. Because sometimes I don't realize it's sin until it hurts somebody else. And then it gets thrown up in my face like, wow, that was a bad deal. Sometimes until it's a conflict. Sometimes until I see consequences. Because we all have a conscience, but it's all messed up. You know, you can feel guilty for things that aren't wrong, and you can feel not guilty for things that are wrong. So if you say, well, it doesn't bother my conscience, it's like, so? How does it stack up against God's word? How does it stack up against the conviction of the Spirit? Because the Spirit comes in and he starts saying, that's not okay anymore. I know you've all done that for a long time, but that's not okay anymore. And this that you've never done before, this is now what we're going to do. He begins to transform us. And that's the third part, is we say, okay, God, I will surrender to you. Because all of us want to be filled with peace and joy and love and all of those wonderful qualities of the fruit of the Spirit. But here's an important understanding. Even though you lean into it with all of your heart, you cannot change your heart now any more than you can save yourself. See, the Bible talks about justification or getting saved by an act of faith and saying, Jesus, I trust you with my life. And then the process from there on is called sanctification. And it's a long time process of God replacing our thoughts with his thoughts and our habits with his habits and our tendencies with his. And it's a process where we say, okay, God, this is a problem. I am like that. It is not okay. Please change me. You see, when you give God permission, when you're confessing, it's not to earn his forgiveness. It's to open up your life so he can take the tumors out. So he can do the surgery that's needed. So he can save your life. So we surrender to the Spirit, and we say, okay, God, today, I want to follow you. I want to listen to you. I want to confess anything you bring to my mind. And I'm afraid sometimes we want to know God's will because we want to vote on it. God, show me what you want, and I'll see if it's okay with me. And God says, you say okay, and then I'll show you what I want, because it's a surrender thing. And the fourth part of that well, here's a, here's a statement from John Piper, which I read this week, which I thought was very profound. You may want to write this down. The Spirit must work from the outside in through Christ-exalting truth and from the inside out through truth-embracing humility. He says the Spirit's working on us from two directions, from giving our minds and our understanding more of God's truth. So, what we were talking about, first of all, the awareness of God and the awareness of who he's made me and what he wants in my life. And then he's got to work on the inside to make me willing to change. Willing, that humility that says, I need help, and I need help from God. And listen, you need help from other people, too. You and God don't get a Bible and go in a cave and work on things. Your life is worked out in your family. It's worked out in your workplace. It's worked out when your power goes out. It's worked out with your neighbors. And in the difficulties and the struggles of life, God brings that outside truth from the scriptures and from other people being examples and challenges and from the inside out, making you willing to change, willing to embrace, wanting to be what God wants instead of what you want. And the fourth part, if you're serious about it, is accountability. You tell somebody else, I'm so serious about changing that when you see me doing the same things that I've been doing and saying the same things I've been saying, you can call me on it. That takes guts, doesn't it? It takes somebody you trust. It takes somebody you love. Let me tell you a little bit about how this works. So I used to be a smart aleck a long time ago, and I, and I like to argue. My early 20s especially, you know what they say, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And I like to argue, and I'm a fast speaker and a fast thinker, and I knew just enough to keep myself ahead of the game, and I found out that I could win a lot of arguments. 
until I began realizing that winning arguments is often losing hearts. That you can never convince somebody to become a follower of Jesus just by being sharp in your arguments. And I read that scripture. It said, the servant of the Lord must not quarrel. And then it goes on and says, even those who oppose you, you must gently instruct in hopes that God would grant them repentance. Like, wow, that's not what I'm doing. And so that awareness came and I began to say, you know what? That arguing, that spirit of wanting to combat, and you know, it's my favorite indoor sport, but I'm going to give it up. And God began to change me as he began to show me, first of all, that it wasn't very pretty in me and that it's not very effective for him. And so God began to change me. And, you know, I see two people arguing now. I go the other way. I, I'm not interested in that's not That's not good. It's not good for relationship. If somebody wants to dialogue, we can dialogue, but that... That arguing, that doesn't do any good. And so God moves through your heart and, and in your spirit he begins to change you until you don't even want to do that anymore. But you know what? Every now and then it still pops up. And my wife said to me some time ago, Paul, when I'm trying to share with you something, every time you say something back, you start it with the word but. But, and I thought, well, I'm accepting what you're saying. I'm just adding this important corollary information. He said, it feels like you're arguing all the time. And you know what I said inside myself? I don't do that. That's not true. You know what happens when somebody calls you on something? You start noticing. And the problem was, every time I started with but, she didn't hear all my wonderful points that came after that. Because I started with but, and I started realizing, I do that. And so I've been working on that. That's the accountability. Because even when you see that you need to change and even when you want to change, unless somebody is patient with you to say, "Um, you're doing that again, we're so caught that we don't see it. And the question is, and this is hard, do you want God's will for your life so much that you're willing to let other people speak into your life? Would you rather be the corrector or the correctee? (laughs) Nobody likes to get corrected. We, we talk about that truth in love thing, it's fine. It's, as long as I'm doing it, it's good. Somebody else is trying to truth in love me. And it goes back to that first question. Do you want to be more like Jesus? Do you want to be transformed by the renewing of your mind? Or do you want to stay the way you are? You can always have that option. But God says, I want to make you more like Jesus and less like you. And what happens with all that? if we allow God to renew our mind, if we submit in humility and say, God, I do want to change. I want to be what you want me to be. Then we get to realize the will of God. I I like this word because he says, I want you, if you notice in chapter 12, verse 2, he says, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. And you say, well, realizing, doesn't that sound just like recognizing? Realizing actually has two meanings to it. It's to become fully aware, which is a part of the process. I need to become aware of God's power and of God's will for me. Second meaning is to achieve things you hope for. You can achieve an investment. You can realize the return when you bought low and you sell high and you make money. You realized the benefit of your investment. And I thought, what a great picture of the will of God That when we surrender to him and we submit, then we begin to find that we can test the will of God. You don't test it so you can see if you want to do it. You test it and say, God, I want your will. Whatever you tell me to do, I've already said yes. And then God begins to tell us. And here's an important understanding. We often are concerned about, should I make that investment? Should I buy that car? Should I move this place? Should I marry this person? We want that kind of will of God. And you know what I think we need to be more focused on? The will of God is that you become full of love and full of joy and full of peace and full of patience and full of kindness and gentleness and humility and faithfulness and self-control. In other words, the will of God is what happens in us through all the decisions and circumstances. Does God give leading in our daily choices? Yes, he does. 
And I'll tell you, you get it from the scriptures, you get it from praying and asking God to give you peace or conviction of the Spirit or to let you know. And here's one you may not like. You also test God's will by asking wise and godly people. You need to, so, you need to have people that are smarter than you helping you out. And when you're humble enough to realize you need help and you get other people's viewpoints and opinions and you don't become a slave of anyone but ask wise people and you will get wisdom that you didn't think of yourself. It's one of the important things I've learned is all my best thinking doesn't have to be done by me. You can learn from a lot wiser people and it opens up all kinds of possibilities. And you begin to test his will, not with the purpose of I'm going to sit here, God, till you blast me and I have to do something. But God, I'm moving ahead. I want to do exactly what you want me to do. And then he says, the wonderful result is we get to approve his will. We get to experience it. You believe God has a destiny and a plan for each one of us? That he has, it says in Ephesians 2, he has good works that he's prepared in advance for us to do. He's already gone ahead, and he has a whole awesome plan. And you know what his plan is? It's good and pleasing and perfect. Let me give you a clue. Your plans are not good, pleasing, and perfect. You don't even know what's going to happen in five minutes, let alone the rest of your life. It's good. It means it's moral, and it's the right choice. It's pleasing to God. It's pleasing to others. It's ultimately pleasing to yourself. You think the people who live with you would be more pleased if you were more loving and more joyful and more peaceful and had all those fruits of the Spirit? And then he says, and it's perfect. It's not only flawless, it's complete. God has a plan for your whole life. And he knows what he's doing far more than you do, far more than I do. So why is it so hard for us to change? I think it's mostly about control. I want to do what I want to do. So you're either conformed to that or you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you can discover the wonderful place that God has for you to live. You can experience God's abundant plan for your life. It's a process of learning, of listening, and choosing to let the Spirit transform you every single day. Learning, listening, choosing, and letting God transform you and make you into more like Jesus. I'm going to give you a chance to say, what am I going to do about this message? It's great to hear good ideas. Yeah, I'd like to be filled with love and joy and peace. That sounds awesome. I really do want the will of God for my life. What are you going to do? Well, in this process of renewing my mind, I laid out four different steps. And I want you to choose at least one of them. And you say, that's the one I need to work on. Let me give you a help. Do you know what God's trying to teach you right now? If we were having a personal conversation, I said, what is God trying to teach you in your life right now? Do you know what that is? If you don't, what you need is awareness. Pray for that. If you do, maybe you need to be able to confess, what is it that's holding you back? Is it habits? Is it fear? Is it other people? What's holding you back? You need to surrender daily. Okay, God, here we go today. I'm going to do whatever you call me to do. And for some of you, it's accountability. You're trying to be the Christian Lone Ranger. You're trying to do it by yourself. And you need to get over that and realize that you need godly people to be examples for you, to be accountability for you, to be encouragers for you, to help walk with you through whatever you're going through. As you think about that, we're going to celebrate communion. It's a tangible way to take in our hands the cracker and the juice and to say, Jesus, you laid down your perfect life so that I could have life. You gave everything so that I could have this possibility of being filled with your spirit and of being filled with love and joy and peace and patience and all of those things. So if you're sitting down here on the floor, we're going to have you come up and take it at one of these tables. You come up the diagonal and then go back either the outside or the middle. If you're up there in the balcony, we're going to serve it to you. And I want you to take that cracker and that cup of juice, and I want you just to take a moment, 
and to think about all that God has done for you and just tell him thank you and I love you. And then I want it to be a moment of surrender where you say, God, I give you permission to work on me any way you need to. A great prayer is, God, is there any sin that's hindering my relationship with you right now? There's always sin, but what is it that's blocking us right now? And if you're here and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, boy, we're glad you're here. It's a great place to understand that, what it means to follow Jesus. But don't do this just to go along with the group. This is, this is an act of worship. This is an act of recommitment of your life. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for giving us hope beyond ourselves, giving us hope beyond this messed up world which is filled with emptiness and darkness and evil. And thank you, God, that you've come and rescued us and that you've given us a connection to you, God the Father, and you've given us a life eternal. And thank you, God, that the Spirit lives in us. As we meditate, God, bring things to our mind that we need to confess, that we need to let go of, that we need to give permission for you to change. And do that work in us, please, that we cannot do in ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Just come on up whenever you're ready, and we'll have this time of worship together. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you.
Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Join me here. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I begins to change us, then he uses us to help change our families, then he uses us to help impact the neighborhood, and then he uses us to change the world around us. Not because of what we can do, but because of what God can do. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for telling us your truth. Thank you that we're not left to stumble around in the darkness and wonder about what life should be about. But you've told us, and then you've come to live that life through us, in us. Help us to surrender to you every day this week. To fill our minds with your word, to allow the accountability that you bring. Show us, God, where we need to surrender more. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me. Or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.